Oh, hello! Almost made me spill my drink! How you doing today? Welcome back to another Cold Blood and Cocktails! As you beautiful people know, like always, any tiff you may have, please cast it away because this is a channel of positive energy, okay? Thank you. Oh, my sassy little sea lions, how you doing today? I hope wherever you're at in the world, you're having a spectacular day so far. I myself am doing absolutely divine, so I'm sure you're wondering, Nady, what the fuck are you wearing? Well, normally there's like an obvious character in my stories, but today's story in part kind of takes place in Miami, Florida. Whenever I think of Florida, the first thing I think of is, of course, that it's God's waiting room. And the second thing I think of is tanned, leathery skin, old people in moo-moos, and just terrible tan lines. Obviously, I can't relate to any of that, but here we are today in our fabulousness. Just shining like a Cheeto-colored beacon in the 3 p.m. sun with a fuzzy navel and a saggy tramp stamp that you can't even see, don't ask. Hold on, I have to adjust my hair. Actually, I lied. This is pineapple juice with a little bit of orange schnapps. I think orange schnapps. I don't know. It's cheap. It's good. Anyways, with today's story, I kind of feel like I'm in the majority here with people who don't like unsolved mysteries. Like, raise your hand if you hate them. It's like having to finish Finish peeing before you're done, you're left with a burning feeling of incompletion. But I also have this platform that I want to use, and all it takes is one person to hear this story to see the police sketch and be like, oh, well, they look familiar, and boom, suddenly the case is reopened. And you know what? Even though this isn't solved, nonetheless, this is still a very interesting story, and for some ways, for me, kind of relatable. I think both with the victim's drive to meet their goals and also with their roller coaster of a relationship, because it was kind of tumultuous, honey. So I apologize for the last a finality for this story to make up for it. Look at my jewels. But I would absolutely love to hear your thoughts on who you think the killer may have been. All right, let's hit it, Daddy. So, New Year's Eve in Miami of 2010 was very, very chilly. Not a cute moment for the usual Speedo boys. The shrinkage was, well, I can't say on the rise. <laughs> Anywho, two people, a couple from Detroit, Michigan, Kevin and Paula, were heating things up with their impromptu trip down to the sandy shores of Muscle Mama's tan daddies and Brazilian butt lifts. Oh, Oh, get me a handful. They were down in South Beach for the holiday weekend to hit the clubs, pop into a few shops, grab a nice dinner, and then head home. Not too bad. But come Monday, Kevin was still in South Beach looking for his now missing girlfriend. The beaches and restaurants were nice and all, but what did they really come down to Miami for? Lady Gaga, of course. Paul insisted on seeing Mother Monster for her New Year's Eve midnight show. I don't blame her. The moment they heard she was performing, they hopped on a plane and Kevin was able to scalp tickets for a small $700 apiece. I mean, we're it. After all, what Bebe wants, Bebe gets. Very smart man. And it really was a good evening. The music was great. At this time, one of Gaga's biggest bops was Poker Face, and it seemed like a lot of the guys dancing around Paula wanted to do just that. She was absolutely stunning. She was picturesque and certainly had a body oddy that even cover girls dreamed of having. What do the boys call it? Tight? Is that still a thing? Ooh, tight body. I can't relate to that one. Hmm. Oh. Damn, this is good. Mwah. Well, Miss Paula, she had no issue showing off her assets, no ma'am, and this had all the men around her dancing and filming her, which I find kind of creepy. Like, who the fuck just whips out their camera and starts filming somebody? But this was almost 15 years ago. I'm pretty sure all they filmed was a dancing pixel. Everywhere Paula went, she was just an instant star and she loved it. Like, she craved the attention and she was ringing in 2010 doing exactly what she loved, acting like a celebrity and being in the presence of actual celebrities. So so like, if you can't tell, Paula wasn't camera shy. She was used to being in the spotlight. She started modeling at a really young age and she was always like the pretty girl next door in the shoots. She'd do a little local modeling. She was the model at the Detroit car shows, but nothing really huge. Wait a second, that ain't supposed to be on. Alexa, turn off the office. Eh, there we go. Sorry about that. No huge gigs, that is, until a Mr. Hugh Hefner put an advert out in search for the 50th anniversary Golden Girl. Think like America's Got Talent meets bikinis and overplucked eyebrows, hair bleach, pink gloss, and harsh eyeliner, and that is what this tryout was. And Paula was literally tits up with excitement, like she could not be more stoked. So Paula steps into the audition, shows off her little bikini, and then of course her birthday suit, and then she leaves. And that was it. She didn't get a call back, but she said she was so happy to do it. It, so I guess it's worth it. You go, Paula. Much braver than I. Cheers to you, sweetie. But it wasn't a total loss. She did end up being in the 50th anniversary video, even if she wouldn't be Miss November. Well, that was years ago. Now things weren't quite as tight as they used to be, but this trip in Miami, now seeing all the attention that she was able to get with Kevin, reignited a flame inside of her. And she told Kevin that, damn it, when I get home, I'm gonna take one last trip into the modeling world and see if I can get any kind of deals. Paula knew she was gorgeous either freaking way, but this was a dream of her. 
helpers, and it's never too late to pursue your dream. You go, you gorgeous gal. My hairline is getting taller and taller. Okay. So to celebrate this reignited passion of Paula's, after just one night in their hotel, they decided to switch shit up and move hotels to a luxury beachfront room. And talk about bougie shit, mama. They spared no expense. You get the room service delivered by a tanned pool boy, you eat caviar, have a bottle of Dom in the bathtub, read a good book, and call it a day. Well, I mean, I would, but not them. They heard there was this club called Club Space that was just popping. And this club they went to makes me feel so fucking old. It's open one day a week, Saturday night to Sunday afternoon. So, like, you have to squeeze a whole week's worth of cocaine, liquor, and sex into one evening if you wanted it to count. So they had a nice and relaxing evening at a great restaurant, went to the hotel, catnapped, and woke up at 3 a.m., got ready, and were heading to the club by 5.30. In the morning, like 5.30 a.m., Ugh, I'm sorry, but 7.30 swings around. This bitch is already in sweatpants. My phone is off. Like, ain't nobody getting a hold of me. I'm done. How does anyone have the energy to wake up and then go clubbing? Well, that's probably why I'm sitting here alone with my wiener dog dressed as a 75-year-old Miami heiress and sipping Dollar Tree juice mixed with schnapps. Still, though, honestly, I'd rather have this than any night at a club. Gonna be honest. But not about me. That's not how this couple thought. Paula put on a pair of strappy six-inch heels, crimped her long blonde hair, and slipped into a sheer blue dress. Now, that part's related. Okay. People at the club said she was like an angelic figure just glowing in the dark with her tan skin and bright locks. Even the bartenders at the club thought she must be someone famous because everyone was just staring at her with their phones out. Like she stepped into any room and just commanded the bitch. Like she was 10 out of a 10 a knockout. And then came poor Kevin's job to ward off all the salivating men on the dance floor. You know, taking their jaws off the ground and putting a stake in their tent. <laughs> Giggity. The men were probably not thinking with this head and they were probably controlled a little bit by their alcohol whereas Kevin was controlled by his love for Paula. But before he knew it there was some dickbag with his hand around Paula's waist grinding his junk up on her and Paula was looking over at Kevin like Meh, okay. I don't think she was hating it, but she knew Kevin wasn't loving it, so she was trying to please both parties. So Kevin's like, nah, this shit isn't cool. Like, I'm not down with this right now. Paula, though, is just sucking in all the attention, and when Kevin says he wants to go, she digs in her stilettos and says, hell no. Well, some bouncers must have been eyeing her and noticed the kerfuffle because suddenly two bodyguards were on either side of Kevin, forcefully escorting him out. Paula's like, well, can I have the credit card? I'm staying. And Kevin, who couldn't get a word in edgewise because of the music, said, fine, fuck it. So he gave her the card, exited, hailed a cab, and left carrying her cell phone like he always did when they went clubbing. Kevin gets to their luxury hotel, slides his little ass into the sheets, and just as the sun was rising, fell asleep without his girlfriend. Unbeknownst to Kevin, if he'd stayed just a few minutes longer outside of that club, this entire story wouldn't exist. Kevin woke up later that day with a throbbing head, I'm back to talking about this one, like the hangover today, it was real, and he was used to leaving Paula at the club, it wasn't ideal, but he was fine with it. Like, Paula was a tough nugget. She could handle herself. She always came back. She had grown up in Detroit, kind of raising herself. Her dad wasn't around. Home life was pretty shitty. And it always felt like anytime there'd be a full moon, she'd have a new stepdad. And this seemed to make her crave attention from men because she didn't really get the fatherly love growing up. Like, this really fucked her up. So much so that when Paula was 14, she started dating a studly 29-year-old man. Mm, don't know about that decision, girl. <laughs> and this was normal for her because her mom seemed to approve. Mom was off in the background bringing in juice boxes and prophylactics like this wasn't some kind of fucked up shit show. So it wasn't her mom that called authorities on Paula's boyfriend. It was Paula's sister, Kelly, who was just fuming at this relationship. Her mom's just like, Yes, this totally makes sense. It's definitely not creepy or weird. But the sister didn't think like that. She called CPS on her own mom's ass, got the dude sent to prison and put on the sex offender list for hooking up with a minor. You go, Kelly. Cheers to you. Ooh, damn, this is making me warm. I don't really have any layers to take off either. But get this steaming pile of hippo shit. Paula waited for him to get out of prison and started dating him again. But in all fairness, by then she was of age and was mentally mature in some ways, but in a lot of other ways, she still was definitely a child. Like, she was still playing with Barbies, and as she grew, she tried to become one. Which, I guess, kind of worked for her because she had legs for days, but she was also ruining her hair from bleaching it so much, she was ruining her skin from always tanning, and her waist was literally the size of my thigh because she was always on diet pills. But the modeling world didn't seem to want that type of look that she was presenting. However, the stripper world did. So that's what she did. She danced at the Penthouse Club in Detroit, saved every tip she earned, 
earned and put it towards college tuition. You go, honey. Till she dropped out. I get it, college isn't for everyone. She had her heart set on dancing more than education and really loved the male attention. It was healing the wounds of love that she never got growing up. And she was realizing that with her dancing skills, she could actually earn probably more than what her degree would ever get her. So much, in fact, that she was able to move herself and Kevin from Michigan all the way over to a beautiful place in Los Angeles. Kevin wasn't so keen on the idea of his girlfriend being an exotic dancer, but Paula said, this is my livelihood. I love doing it. It's either this or there's no us. So of course, Kevin was like, fine, baby doll, dance your heart out. At the end of the day, I'm yours. You're mine. We're each other's. The dancing is just a job and actually a job that would soon support the both of them because Kevin's real estate business went down in flames with the housing recession. Houses may not have been selling, but sex will always sell. So Paula's bank account was growing higher than a Southern Belle's hair. She really had no issue paying their bills, moving them between LA and Michigan. Like she was cool with all that. But now Kevin was sitting all alone in bed in Miami with his killer hangover, growing deeply concerned about his girlfriend's whereabouts. Checkout time is quickly approaching. So the front desk calls the room to see if they should roll it over for another night. Kevin is shitting bricks. So he goes down to the clerk to ask for help. The guy at the front desk is like, of course I remember her. She's a walking goddess. Let's get pictures of her out. Ask around. Maybe she's still at the club. Let's not freak the fuck out just yet. Famous last words. Don't freak out. Anyways, they send her information to the radio and TV stations. Kevin headed over to the Miami Police Department to file a missing persons report, but they denied him and said it hasn't been 24 hours. I think at this point it had been maybe like 12 or 13, but still this wasn't right. Like Kevin could feel in his gut that something was wrong and it wasn't the Chipotle that he'd ordered last night talking either. Like this was just very unlike Paula. He just kept telling anyone who'd listen, we're from out of town. Something isn't right, please help. But nothing, like nobody could offer any assistance. So every few minutes he would call the local hospitals and jails. He went back to the club, but there was no sign of her there. He went to the surrounding gas stations, showed the attendants her pictures, but with no luck because everyone's shift had changed since then. Now in like a panic desperation mode, he called local private investigators begging for their assistance. Like how frustrating must that have been to know that there is something wrong with your partner, but nobody will do anything. That's just really sad. And that night, once again, he went to bed alone without his girlfriend. By now, as one could imagine, he couldn't sleep for fear that something bad had happened to Paula. Like, can you imagine your girlfriend is there and then suddenly she isn't? And that would be fucked up in the city that you're from, but they were in a place that they totally weren't used to. The next morning, Kevin got a call from one of the PIs named Dave, who did a mini interview with Kevin. And the PI said, yeah, let's do this. Let's find Paula. Meet me at the station to file a missing persons report and we can get started. So Kevin and files the report and Dave heads straight to the club, but not to down a few shots or do a few lines in the bathroom. No, pretty much unlike everyone else there, he was on a mission to interview all of the workers. One of the bouncers said that shortly after Kevin was removed from the club induced, Paula herself left. The club policy was to remove both parties after any fight, but unfortunately this info was as thin as an eggshell and about as helpful as a hot poker to the nip. So Dave calls the local medical examiner. They ask Kevin for a full description and after a moment of silence, they respond and said, we're sending out a detective. Obviously, that was terrible news. Poor Kevin's heart just drops to his feet. Like after hours and hours of frantically worrying, his worst fear might be confirmed. The detectives ask him if she had any body piercings and he's like, yeah, she did. So they pulled out a Ziploc baggie that had two charred and black and piercing posts in them. And he said, no, I don't think those are from her. They don't look familiar. It's kind of hard to tell because they were burnt. So he shows them pictures of Paula and they notice earrings that she's wearing. The detectives pull up a photo of a pair of the same earrings and immediately he knew they belonged to Paula. And in that second, Kevin's whole world just crumbled. He was shattered, not just because the love of his life was apparently dead, but because of how she died. Paula's earrings had been found outside of a burning dumpster and within the blaze appeared to be the charred remains of what could possibly have been a human. At the time of the police's arrival, the dumpster was shooting out flames and nobody could tell if the remains were male or female. I can't even imagine how torturous of a mental image that must have been for Kevin. Like, I think I would probably lose my shit completely. And now, even when you watch interviews of him today, he's still deeply disturbed by this. Like, he's always crying when he talks about this. It's so heartbreaking. Oh, damn, we need more of this. Police take the body to the local medical examiner who determined that the body was indeed female. And the medical examiner was just reporting this to the police when the police called about Paula going missing and they matched up the remains dental records up with Paula's to find that it was a perfect match. Kevin was driven to the police station in North Miami where Paula's body
body had been found, which was like 10 miles from the club. So who knows if she walked that distance, if she was abducted or killed and then dumped. There's just so many questions and police are interrogating Kevin hardcore. Like they were very skeptical of him. How was he going to explain that he had nothing to do with this murder despite having a public argument in this club? Like he looked very suspicious. We have to take a suspicious shot. I don't know. This is a weird one. At this point, Kevin wasn't off the suspect list. Like he was sufficiently distraught posting flyers around town that she was missing, staying in Miami to look for her, and showing clear emotional reaction to her death. But on the other hand, he was the boyfriend and who's usually the first suspect? The lover. So he was the first person of interest. He was taken in. He was stripped of all his clothes, photographed for any scratch marks that could have been caused by a struggling Paula, and was interviewed for 12 hours straight by police. And it really didn't take long for detectives to learn that their relationship wasn't as picture perfect as Paula herself was. A police report had been filed because Paula hit Kevin with a glass bottle, but at the time, Kevin had refused to press charges. Other reports said that just a few months before the Miami trip, there were several domestic abuse reports between the two, one of which said that Kevin had broken Paula's nose during a fight. So clearly, police had their radar on Kevin because not only was he among the last people to see her alive, they had a long history of violence, so it makes sense. And I just have to say, we do not put up with that fucking bullshit here. If you are in a relationship like this and you want to get help, there is help, honey. Seek it, please. Whether you are male or female or anyone in between, you have way too much to offer this world to put up with that shit. No, 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 no. But if that wasn't bad enough for Kevin, when they were at the Lady Gaga concert, somebody filmed Kevin being a little bit too rough with Paula and they described him as being overly aggressive. Not good. And after just a little bit more digging, police found that Paula had allegedly sent a text to her ex saying, he's trying to kill me. He being Kevin. So shit really didn't look too cute. Any ball that was in Kevin's court was saggy and floppy. His case was as limp as a broken wrist. It needed some Viagra. So I'm sure everyone's wondering, why did Paula stay with Kevin? Like even her parents had been concerned saying they hated Kevin. On multiple occasions, Paula's mom would get texts saying that she was hiding from the beast and was scared for her life. I guess allegedly Kevin would threaten her saying that she'd never work again and was basically a worthless piece of shit. Allegedly. And apparently at the club, just in front of the bar, the bartender remembers seeing this beautiful woman who was Paula standing there when all of a sudden this short-tempered seeming guy walks up to her and aggressively grabs her by the arm. And right then and there, this guy and the girl start arguing. And that's when the bouncers remove them separately. And this looks terrible to the cops who, after hearing this information, put him as the number one for sure suspect. Detectives were like, fuck everyone else. This is the guy. I mean, it would make perfect sense. The dude seems to have an anger issue. There's a long history of violence between these two. He left just before her at the club, giving him the perfect opportunity to follow her, attack her, and dispose of her body in the dumpster. Any evidence was destroyed in the flames. Why couldn't it be him? But then there's also no evidence, so how could it be him? Then the fucking media got a hold of this information, and as time moved on, there was suddenly an attacking frenzy on Kevin, saying that he was clearly guilty, and reporters smeared his name all over the news like bird shit on a car window. The police start playing good cop, bad cop, saying, we know you did it, but we totally get it. It was an accident or a mistake or a moment of poor judgment. It's okay to admit it, but Kevin's like, I can't admit to something I didn't do. But police don't buy it. How could it not be him? Even Paula's mother pointed her finger at him. But then, like the crimson chin, someone came in to help clear Kevin's name. Someone very unexpected, too. Paula's sister, Kelly, the one who called CPS on her mom's ass as a child, she was now saying that he didn't deserve this abuse he was receiving in the media and by the police. She said, yeah, he shouldn't have left her at the club. He especially shouldn't have had her phone. But he was devastated and will forever feel guilty about about all of that. And now, after time had passed since the killing, Kevin was becoming suicidal over the anguish of Paula's death, and Kelly knew without a doubt that he wasn't guilty. Kelly's like, well, honestly, they're both crazy, but when they're not drinking, they're fine, which unfortunately isn't very often. Kevin was an angry and abusive drunk. Paula was popping handfuls of prescription diet pills, and when those pills mixed with alcohol, it was like freaking night and day. Kelly was like, that broken nose that was reported was actually an accident, and that text Paula had sent 
saying that Kevin was trying to kill her was actually way older than they thought, and it was sent to the ex that was put on the sex offender list. And Kelly wasn't making excuses or apologies for her sister's crazy booze and party and pill-filled lifestyle, but she remembered a sister who was obsessed with Barbies and who even caught the bouquet at her wedding. Now her sibling was reduced to a sensation that the 11 o'clock news obsessed over. Like the headlines would say, a Barbie wannabe model found in a burning dumpster, and the headlines would treat her like she was as worthless as the trash inside of the dumpster, just an object that was thrown away. Kelly was determined to clear Kevin's name so that the police could find the real killer. After all, most detectives say that after like the first 48 hours, the likelihood of solving a case is cut right the fuck in half. It seemed like the cops had almost wanted to blame Kevin just to get the case over and done with, but Kelly knew that if they sent Kevin away, the real killer could strike again. So she hopped her ass on a plane, drove around to the club and the dumpster where Paula was found. Since the police were on Kevin's ass and Kevin's ass alone, I think she was desperate for answers and was just hoping to find any clue that would help tip the police and switch their gears to broaden their search. After noticing that both clubs on either side of Club Space had a copious number of cameras, Kelly asked management if Club Space itself had security footage, something that you would have thought by now investigators would have asked for. That's too much work. <laughs> but the private detective got on board with Kelly and it turns out that almost all of the 30 cameras at Club Space were aimed at the bar for safety of the bartenders and there really weren't that many cameras facing outside. But for hours and hours, Kelly and the PI sat down to look through all of the footage that the cameras had recorded that night, not seeing a single glimpse of Paula. Then like a platinum blonde lighthouse glowing in the night, they finally spotted her on one camera that was placed just over the front door entrance. Without a doubt, it was her, even though it was a mere seven seconds of grainy video, there was no mistaking the hair, the heels, the dress, walking out at 7.20 a.m. And when they rewound the tape about five minutes, you can see Kevin begging the bouncers to either let him stay or make her come with him. But the bouncers were like, she wants to stay, you gotta go, bro. So at 7.17 a.m., Kevin can be seen leaving the club alone, a choice he'd forever regret and have nightmares about. But then the head of security and a few other club workers added another detail that wasn't seen on the camera. Yes, both Kevin and Paula stepped out of the club separately and alone, but the bouncer said that once Paula reached the street, she could be seen walking with someone, someone from outside that hadn't been filmed on the inside security footage. This person was described to be an average height, well-groomed, built, medium-toned man with a trimmed beard. None of this description fit Kevin. But according to the bouncers, there was no rag with chloroform, there was no gun held to Paula's back, but the club space staff said they were just walking away, holding hands as if they were a couple. First of all, what the fuck? This deserves a suspicion shot, because what the hell? Second of all, while researching this, I was very loosely admiring parts of Kevin's mentality with being so trustworthy of Paula, with her constant male attention, being okay with her job, and being naked and gawked at by men all day. And I guess how he had faith in Paula not to do anything inappropriate, so that if he wanted to go back to the room, he had no qualms over how she would interact with other people. But now that we know she was holding hands with another guy, it kind of makes you wonder if the trust was actually there. Like, that relationship it must have been pretty fucking stressful to always be wondering, oh, is this person out doing stuff behind my back? And I have no idea for certain, but it makes me wonder if that's what a lot of their fights were about. Or maybe he was just super fucking angry all the time. I don't know. But regardless, this information was somewhat pivotal because it kind of cleared Kevin's name as being the very last person that Paula probably saw. Like, had it not been for those witnesses, I kind of have a feeling that Kevin would have been blamed. Kevin knew Paula very, very well, though, and he knew she would never just up and meet someone on the street and two seconds later hold hands with them. They were from Detroit, and honey, let me tell you, I live in Michigan. The D is a place you do not want to fuck around. It can be very, very dangerous. So that scenario just wasn't plausible for Paula. That would have been so unlike her. Kevin told police this man had to have been somebody that was in the club and had to have introduced themselves to Paula previously, maybe even while Kevin was still there. After all, Paula had men pouring themselves over her, literally gushing, giggity. Maybe police should look further at the security footage to find a man that meets the description. So, back to the drawing boards the police go, repeatedly looking at the seven second clip of Paula. That's all they had on her. And suddenly a light bulb clicks and they have a new theory. There were a bunch of people near the entrance just standing. You can actually see Paula exiting, everyone's staring, and a few seconds later you see a couple of those people walk out behind her. A few seconds after that you see the bouncers who had been watching Paula leave follow everyone out. Could the mystery man be one of the guys that left between the security guards and Paula or maybe even be a security guard? 
Ooh, what if the guards had spotted Paula, made a plan to get rid of Kevin so they could have her to themselves, made a story about her holding hands with some random ass guy that didn't even seem to be filmed, and then they killed her themselves. But police that, yeah, that's pretty doubtful. It's a very unlikely conspiracy theory. If you watch the footage, you can tell that the security crew were actually very helpful and multiple witnesses said that they had escorted her out of the club for safety. They followed her out to the street to make sure that there was no issues once she reached the road. And every single employee in the building had been accounted for because you can't leave without using a fingerprint system. So that blew an even bigger hole in this theory. So security confirmed that whoever Paula was walking with down the street definitely wasn't in the club, especially because he had been wearing shorts and this club was the shit. It doesn't matter if you're a multi-billionaire, you don't wear shorts to this club and get in. Like, bitch, there's a strict ass dress code. Well, a few months after Paula's murder, club space employees were gooped, gobsmacked, and gagged because they could have sworn they saw the exact same man that had left holding hands with Paula, now again on the street in front of the club. The balls on this man had to be the size of fucking grapefruits because holy shit, how fucking dumb can you be? He was back, shameless and stupid, or so they thought. The club owner calls the cops to come interrogate him, but they just let him go. They're like, well, just because she may have been with him, which we don't even know for sure, it doesn't mean that he's the one that did it. So what the fuck happened for the 14 hours that she was missing from the time when she left the club to the time when her burned body was found. Kevin wasn't getting any answers so he eventually heads back to Michigan and is convicted of a misdemeanor assault charge for one of the domestic violence cases but the other charges were dropped. Police still say Kevin is a man of interest but they're on the prowl for the man that the security guards described. Kelly too headed back to Michigan but a month later returned back to Miami to put up posters of her sister everywhere and make TV appearances to help bring awareness to Paula's murder and the loose killer and she even put up a cash reward for anyone with any kind of information. Then suddenly police randomly issued a sketch of the man that Paula had been walking with. The club staff had only seen the man from behind, so they didn't really have that much to go off of, but a new source said they saw the entire interaction face on. Paula came out of the club, began talking to this guy, and a few moments later, they walked off together hand in hand. But still, there was no evidence that this guy had been in the club with Paula, so who the fuck was he? Kevin swears that this sketch looks just like one of the bouncers at the club, which would reignite the theory that it was the security team covering up a murder. After after all, it was the bouncers who denounced that theory. Could their denial have been a cover-up? I don't know, anything's possible. Kevin wasn't convinced that it wasn't an employee, so he went undercover back to the club a few months later, only to find that almost all of the staff had changed and none of the same bouncers were employed. Can we get a suspicious shot for that? Whew, mm, mm-hmm. Everyone was gone. The door guys were gone. The security was different. Everyone seems to have changed. But then the club owner says that literally no one's changed and they have the pay stubs to prove it. So are they covering something up or is this just Kevin desperate for answers? Maybe the day he went back there was just a different shift of people working? Could one of the employees be the murderer? Sadly, we don't know because the killer is indeed still on the loose over a decade after the crime. I don't know that this case is still very active, but it certainly won't be forgotten. Like, somebody got away with murder and more importantly, an innocent life was lost and another life destroyed. And I've already said it, I fucking hate unsolved crime stories because they're just an open end. I just need there to be closure, it's like eating really good food and then for the last bite there's a huge chunk of hair in it. But like I said, I want to be able to use my platform to help spread awareness. So if you know who this guy is, please fucking report it. Just takes one person out there to change a life. Just Google that Crime Stopper phone number, easy breezy. But yeah, this story is just sad because I really love seeing people pursue their dreams. It's not fair that life was just cut from Paula. But who do you think rose the most flags? Do you think that Kevin had a hand in it or the bouncers? Do you think that it was just a random random ass murder. There really isn't much evidence for anything here and that's such a weird thing to say this day and age because there's always cameras on everybody and it seems like with DNA and everything there's always a little way to help solve a crime but this is just like flatlined. If you happen to hear anything on this case please comment down below. I will definitely be keeping an eye on it. But my beautiful babes there you go. Thank you so much for being here. My god these are filthy. I do truly love having you so damn much. It's disgusting. I sicken myself. I also love this look with the glasses. What the hell? I should have just worn them. <laughs> oh, but that tan. Okay, anyways, I will see you all next time. I'm gonna try my hardest to do this every week. I'm trying to get on a schedule. Wish me luck because honey, I'll need it. But you know the spiel. If you want a little bit more me in your life, please head over to my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash poplux. You get videos a day early. You get Patreon only content. And best part, it is cheap, fun, and fancy just like me. And like always, please be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell down below so that you're 
you're notified anytime I upload a new video. Don't forget my newest collection of highlighters, including Black Ice, which does change from black to white, will be available again soon at thepoplux.com. Also, my latest album, Kiss of Fame, is available everywhere online that music is sold. Thank you so much to everyone who's supporting them. Comment down below, let me know what you thought of this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You can follow me on Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter at Official and you can follow me online at thepoplux.com. Thank you so much for watching. I love you all, and I will see you again soon. Bye.